thanks for listening. My name is Andrew Callan, and I am one of the co-authors on our manuscript, which has been recently published in AJR, titled Facial Feminization Surgery, Key CT Findings for Preoperative Planning and Postoperative Evaluation. Today, I'm going to provide you with some highlights and major takeaway points from our paper, which will hopefully encourage you to read the work for yourself and, if relevant to your practice, help improve the care of your transgender patients. I became interested in this project when we observed an increase in the number of CT studies performed for the purposes of pre- or post-operative assessment of facial feminization surgery. And it became rapidly evident that as radiologists, we were not adequately familiar with this procedure in order to provide value in our analysis and reporting. One of the reasons I love radiology is that it's a great equalizer. We have the privilege of looking into people's bodies in shades of gray. In neuroradiology, we spend lots of time looking at our patients' faces and whether we're aware of it or not, there are visual cues evident on CT images of the face, which our minds use to identify a person as male or female. These cues are the surgical targets of gender-affirming facial feminization surgery. Now, most people will look at these two images, these illustrations, and know intuitively that the image on the left is one of a male face, and the image on the right is one of a female face. Extensive neuropsychologic testing has been done to identify which facial features contribute most to visual gender discernment. And it turns out that those structures which most strongly contribute to this discernment include the supraorbital ridge, particularly its relationship to the nose, manifested by the nasofrontal angle, as well as the width and prominence of the jaw and chin. Therefore, these are the targets of facial feminization surgery. And in this regard, the preoperative evaluation can be broken down into thirds with the upper third of the face, including the forehead and its relationship to the nose, which is addressed via frontal recontouring with or without frontal sinus osteotomy. The middle third of the face centered on the nose itself, which is the target of rhinoplasty. And the lower third of the face comprised of the jaw and chin, which are ad addressed by genioplasty and mandible angle osteotomy. Now, we describe a number of quantifiable, relevant, and reportable metrics in our paper. However, three that I want to highlight here are the nasofrontal angle, frontal prominence to mid-cellar distance, and nasolabial angle. The relationship of the superorbital ridge to the nose can be quantified by the nasofrontal angle and the frontal prominence to mid-cellar distance. The nasofrontal angle is assessed by measuring the angle formed by lines tangent to the glabella, between the eyes um, in the, the lower forehead and the nasal bridge here, meeting at the nasion here, indicated by the asterisk, to form its apex. The frontal prominence to uh, cellar distance here, identified by line B, is measured by drawing a line from the outer table of the frontal sinus to the mid cella. Finally, the nasal labial angle is formed with its apex at the subnasale here, which is the point at which the lower border of the nose meets the outer contour of the upper lip. The upper face can be classified via the Oosterhout classification, whereby a type one frontal sinus is manifested by a thick outer table, is minimally pneumatized, and as you could imagine, would only require some contouring without frank osteotomy and frontal sinus setback to achieve the appropriate feminine proportions. Whereas a type three frontal sinus is heavily aerated and has a very thin outer table of the frontal sinus with a large anterior projection of the supraorbital rims, which requires a osteotomy and frontal sinus setback to achieve reduction of the frontal prominence to cellar distance and increase in the nasofrontal angle. The classification of the frontal sinus should be described in the radiology report. Additionally, because dissection and osteotomy are performed in close proximity to the supraorbital rims, there is risk of injury to the supraorbital nerves, which provides sensory innervation to the forehead. Radiologists should assess the position and morphology of the supraorbital foramina, which can develop as a notch contiguous with the supraorbital ridge, shown here on the left, or as a distinct structure separate from the ridge, shown here on the right. If notched, Intraoperatively, the supraorbital neurovascular bundle is released and protected, but if a distinct foramen is present, then osteotomy is performed to release the bundle. But if the foramen is too far from the rim, generally more than a centimeter, to safely perform osteotomy, the surgeon must decide whether to sacrifice the nerve or limit the planned contour. Therefore, the morphology and location of the supraorbital foramina should be described in the radiology report in a standardized fashion. 
Now, visually, the mid face is anchored by the nose, the superior border border of which is defined by the nasion, which is the intersection of the frontal and nasal bones and forms the osseous apex of the nasofrontal angle, shown here in red. Rhinoplasty is performed to complement the degree of frontal recontouring and increase the nasofrontal angle, as well as the nasolabial angle, shown here in blue. You can imagine if there's a nasal dorsum, and a large nasal dorsum, also called a nasal hump, there is the nasal frontal angle is more acute and the, the nasal dorsum will require a reduction as well. So as such, rhinoplasty really varies substantially between patients depending on their preoperative anatomy and is addressed via these medial oblique osteotomies shown here in green and also can be addressed via septoplasty as significant septal deviation can inform the overall nasal shape. Now, the lower face is best assessed in the anteroposterior projection, and via CT, this is done via 3D reconstruction. So in the AP plane, the width of the jaw, um, so-called gonial angles shown here in red, and the shape of the menton or the lower chin are the primary visual cues for facial gender. A horizontal line drawn tangent to the chin here in green contacts more of the mandible preoperatively compared with postoperatively showing that the chin is a bit more pointed postoperatively and that there's been a reduction in this kind of square masculine shape via mandible angle osteotomy and genioplasty. In this patient, you can see that frontal recontouring was done via frontal osteotomy and no rhinoplasty was performed. In the lower face, there are some anatomic considerations which should be described in the radiology report. During surgical access, the mental foramen is identified and dissected to protect its neurovascular bundles which contain terminal branches of the inferior alveolar nerve. And upon exit from the foramen, the inferior alveolar nerve takes an inferior course. And because of this, the superior extent of the genioplasty osteotomy must be at least half a centimeter inferior to the mental foramen. And additionally, in the intramandibular course of the nerve must be assessed as well prior to genioplasty to avoid nerve damage. Usually the mental foramen is positioned between the first and second premolars, although variant positioning can occur and the mental foramen can be duplicated or triplicated. Here's an example of a duplicated mental foramen. Finally, the presence of any impacted mandibular teeth may inform the, uh, the planning cut line for the mandibular angle osteotomy. And it should be described in the radiology report so that it can be addressed either prior to or during surgical access. Now, postoperative CT may be performed when there's clinical suspicion for an operative complication. And as radiologists, we're very familiar with assessing hardware after fixation, and that, that assessment includes scrutinization for surrounding lucency or fluid collection. So here's an example of a periscrew lucency, as well as an associated fluid collection in a patient with hardware infection after their surgery. But in addition to hardware and soft tissue scrutinization, the postoperative CT assessment should include inspection of the osteotomy lines to ensure that the surrounding structures have not been violated. So in this example, the genioplasty osteotomy was too close to the inferior wall of the inferior alveolar nerve canal and the patient presented with postoperative lip, lip numbness. Similarly, the frontal bone osteotomy should not contact the supraorbital foramina. These features should be reported in a standardized fashion. In order to facilitate that reporting, we've created a structured reporting template, which addresses the key features relevant to operative planning for patients undergoing facial feminization surgery. This template is available as figure four in our manuscript. Thanks for listening. I hope I've encouraged you to check out our manuscript, which covers these and other important CT imaging features of facial feminization surgery, including the description of other reportable metrics and a recommended image acquisition protocol. We hope this presentation and our manuscript facilitate improved analysis of imaging related to this procedure and thereby improved care for our transgender patients.